We're continuing our study on the story of God. And as, as we do continue this, I, I, I do want to highlight for you uh, one, um, you know, one thing that we're, we're looking at in the course of this, and we'll uh, touch on a little bit later, the, the way in which we do have, I mentioned it in the sermon this morning, a common humanity. We are able to talk with people, even if they don't have a similar uh, religious fr framework with us. We're able to talk with them because they are human beings. And with that common humanity, we are able to, to reach out. I, I want to be emphasizing that as we move along because all of our friends and neighbors, the greatest need they have in their lives is the need to be right with God in Jesus Christ. That's the biggest need they have. Now, they may have different specific needs in their lives, but it all feeds back to this one thing, the need to be whole. And so with, with kindness, with compassion, we can engage uh, anyone and find a starting point for discussion. As we look at the story of God, let's, let me tell you the story about the God who became fully human. And as we get into this story, we're finding a story that has been in part repeated throughout the world in every culture you find stories of spiritual beings, gods, walking among people. As we've mentioned before, our lessons are, are cumulative. They, they feed on each other. And we, we began our series looking at the problem of the infinite impersonal God. And we must realize that the God of Scripture, the God revealed to us in Scripture, is radically different from the competing ideas of God. Now, we look through the world, and you're, you're going to find that most people, and I'm not talking about a thin majority, I mean the overwhelming majority of people throughout history and in most places in the world believe in a spiritual reality. They believe in a God or gods of some sort. And you begin looking in the world today, that is true. You go to, to Africa, and with the odd exception of South Africa, with its European moorings, the rest of the continent is filled with believers. Now, in the north, they're overwhelmingly involved with Islam. As you move to the south, they're involved in a lot of different denominational groups or the various native religions. But quite simply, once again, with that exception of South Africa, the rest of the continent You'd be really hard-pressed to find an atheist. Now, in, you look at India, much the same thing. Overwhelmingly, they're Hindu, a large minority Muslim, a scattering of other religions. But you'd be very hard-pressed to find an atheist. And this has been normal in the world. Disbelief is a very odd thing historically. But of those who believe in God, the God of the Bible is very, very different because he is both infinite and personal. The God's of the pagans, such as the Greco-Roman pantheon or the Norse uh, gods, they were not infinite. 
even all of the Greek and Roman gods put together were not infinite. The gods were more like what we think of as superheroes. They were like us in just about every way, except that they had certain powers. And by the way, none of them had all the power. So they, they were not infinite. On the other hand, a lot of the Eastern concepts of God, whether you're talking about Taoism or Buddhism, you find that their view is focused on the infinite. But they don't view God as being personal. God is completely separate. And so what does that mean when you talk about deity being in human form? Well, you look at the, the Greco-Roman gods, and very often they walked among human beings. By the way, usually it was in order to satisfy sexual pleasure, and then they produced offspring. So the continuity between gods and mankind were such that they could interbreed. On the other hand, we find in the Eastern religion, the concept of an avatar, the term that's used in Hinduism, that there's someone that really isn't a human being, but it's a mask being worn. Now, what do we do with this? What do we do with the idea that you, you go through any folk uh, story that you want to find, any any pagan religion, you're going to find some continuity, some uh, similarities with what we read in the Bible. Well, C.S. Lewis is one who frequently highlighted that this should confirm to us that the Bible is true because human beings everywhere are looking for the same sorts of things that we find in scripture. In the early church, a writer named Tertullian makes the point that the testimony of the soul is naturally Christian. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that when you get into someone's life and their aspirations and their moral compass, and the way in which they, in their very souls, believe the universe to be, you have a common ground where Christianity provides the ultimate answers. Now, we do have to emphasize there are discontinuities. Uh, the gods of mythology, once again, were not infinite. And in point of fact, they even all together could not accomplish everything they wanted to accomplish. And morally, not only were they bigger in their power, they were bigger in their sins. Uh, they were not particularly noble individuals as they're described. And then you think in terms of the avatars of the infinite, uh, the various incarnations of the Buddha or other uh, claims that there are um, individuals that are a projection. Ultimately, an avatar is not a human being who partakes of deity, but rather it's simply deity speaking through a person or through an appearance of a person. Uh, you think in terms of God speaking through Balaam's donkey. Did God become a donkey? No, but he spoke through the donkey. In the same way, the avatar is either an apparition, or if it is a living person, it's someone channeling the deity, but the deity is not what you're seeing. In contrast to that, we have the Christian view, the biblical view of the incarnation. One 
who is fully God becomes fully human. Now, this is one of those things that are classified as a mystery. Now, when we use the term mystery, unfortunately, in our language, it is brought forward the idea of something that's spooky or something that you're going to solve. So if I talk about reading a, a mystery novel, it either has elements that are fantastic, mysterious in that sense, or it's a whodunit. And I need to solve the problem. A murder mystery is one that lays out a problem and you, and you are trying before you get to the end of the book to solve who it is. In contrast to that, when we talk about a mystery in terms of Christian faith, you're not talking about something that's spooky, although it is outside of our normal realm of experience. And you're not talking about something you could figure out on your own. What you have is something that you only can know because God has told you that it is so. Um, the Bible's simply chock full of these. God created the world by speaking it into existence. How did he do that? And ultimately, we don't know. And by the way, science can't, uh, can't come up with an explanation for how something came to be. Uh, Rick Schmizzi used to use the illustration of a scientist walking up to God and saying, God, we, we've learned how to make life. We can create life in the lab. So your creating life isn't all that spectacular. And God says to him, oh, well, how did, how did, you, how did you manage that? And the scientist said, well, first of all, you got to take some dirt. And God says, uh-uh. You get your own dirt, which underscores the idea that if you reject what the Bible says about creation, you're still stuck with the problem of how did things get here? And it's not very satisfying to say, well, it's always been here. Well, that, that, that begins to sound a whole lot like God. Um, a lot of mysteries, and the idea of the incarnation is a mystery. For that reason, we need to be cautious. We need to make sure we affirm everything the Bible says about the person, the Son of God, who took the name Jesus. We must affirm everything. And recognize that there are things that we can't explain. Sometimes it's obvious that there is an explanation, but we don't know what it is. For example, we read about Jesus growing in wisdom. Now, we don't have a problem with the stature business. Somehow we can get our mind around a child growing up. But how can God grow in wisdom? And yet, that's what it says. And we have to affirm this is so. Uh, likewise, during his earthly ministry, there were times where Jesus uh, seemingly had limited knowledge. Uh, when the woman touched him to be healed with the issue of blood, the text says that he knew someone had touched him for he felt the virtue or the power leave him. Now, the way that is worded makes it sound very much as if he really did not know which of these people who were touching him, that he did not know in the moment who it was because he asked who touched me. Now, how could that be? Oh, we don't know. We don't know. And yet, we recognize that he never ceased being God, but he became fully human. His deity, emphasized in John 17, 24, 
Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. He always existed. And he was always in relationship with the Father. Now, this relationship is highlighted in John chapter 1. And John 1 verse 1 is simultaneously one of the simplest and one of the most profound verses in all of scripture. I say simple because if you have even a smattering of Greek, you can read this verse in the original. In arcane ain heologos. In the beginning was the word. It is as easy in Greek as it is in English. It's not a difficult construction. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now, Greek has an interesting use of the article. It uh, does not have an indefinite article, a or an, but it has the definite article, the. And in the original, it said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God, and the word was God. No article. Now, in Greek, the use of an article, even as we use it, discuss something that is specific, but the absence of an article is qualitative. So a good way to translate this would be to say, the word was with the deity and the word was divine. So what do you have here? You have the word in relationship with someone, and we're going to find that this someone is the father. Later in John chapter one, he's identified as such. Further, this word, the term word is only used just very sparsely to describe the son of God. Sometimes people hang a whole lot on what they call logos theology, the word theology. But it is a descriptive much in the way that Jesus describes himself as a door or a vine. The word, it means something, but it isn't all encompassing. But this, this individual, the word, was both with God and he was divine. Again, John chapter 1, let's drop down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice the Son comes from the Father. It is always appropriate to refer to the second person of the Trinity as the Son, God the Son. Sometimes people get really hung up on, well, no, 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 before the incarnation, he was the Logos, he became the, no, 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 notice it says, the Son comes from the Father. Further, if it's appropriate to refer to the first person of the Trinity as Father, and everyone feels that that's appropriate. It sort of begs the question, father of whom? The son who is sent from the father is the one who has shown us glory. Dropping down again to verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, 
who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Notice God is used in two different ways. No one has seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, obviously a reference to the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, he's the one who provides the knowledge of what deity is. Now, we as a culture, have placed a tremendous emphasis on the birth narrative of Christ. And that's intriguing because even among religious groups that use a liturgical calendar, in other words, who follow the various holy days in the course of the year, it only began to be really focused on in the 1800s of Christmas. The Christian holy day historically was always Easter. And it shouldn't surprise you. You look in the gospel accounts and you have in the gospel of John and in the gospel of Mark, Absolutely no description of the birth. Now, John provides an explanation of the birth, an explanation of the incarnation, but it doesn't tell you the details. Matthew provides a little bit. Luke provides a very extensive, by the way, as an aside, I really do believe that Luke compiled his narrative based on information he gained from Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, Luke tells us that he interviewed witnesses. He gathered eyewitness accounts. And there's a lot of stuff in there that Mary's the only one who knew it. In particular, it talks about what Mary was thinking, that she turned it over in her heart. Well, who knows that? Well, Mary knew it. She apparently told Luke. So the, the opening sections of Luke's gospel, very replete. It is important, it is important that it is recorded that Jesus was born of a woman. That was a promise. I mentioned that earlier in the sermon. It was a promise given in the book of Genesis. After the transgression, Eve was told that it was from the seed of woman, from her seed that salvation would come. So how did this happen? Well, we don't much know. We know that the angel appeared to a young woman who was a virgin, and told her she was going to, to have a child, and, and Mary said, how's that going to happen? That's, that's a pretty good question. Luke 1 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Now, the biological mechanics of this, it's obviously miraculous. And how it happened and at what point did it did nature take over um it's my opinion and since it's my opinion it's very true but it's my opinion that the miracle of the conception was supernatural and miraculous and then from that time on mary had a normal pregnancy uh, by the way, the Catholic Church does not hold that opinion, but rather it puts forward that it was a miraculous event all the way through, so much so that when 
uh, Jesus was born, he was born without Mary going through childbirth. That just as later in the Gospels, Jesus would appear in a sealed room, that Jesus miraculously left her womb and appeared in the manger without the process of birth occurring. Now, there are some reasons they hold to that. I don't buy any of them. But the point being, in the conception, we can't explain it away through science. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. And for that reason, it was understood that he was the Son of God. Matthew 1 beginning in verse 20. Joseph found that his betrothed, which is a concept that is more legally binding than our engagement idea is, that the woman he was supposed to be married to was pregnant. And he had had sexual relations with her, so his assumption let's face it, it was a good assumption, was that there had been immorality. And so he was thinking, well, I'm not going to marry her, but how can I, how can I disengage from this situation and cause her as little pain as possible? By the way, the Bible says that he was a just man. That word means he was, he was equitable. He wasn't vengeful. He was compassionate. But picking up verse 20 of Matthew 1, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, there is something that happened. When the incarnation occurred, the eternal son of God, took to himself a human form, and became Jesus. He was not Jesus until he was given that name. He was given that name by the legal entity who had the power to do that. His legal father, Joseph, obeyed the instruction from God, and his name was Jesus means the same thing as Joshua. It's a very common name, still is common, uh, not in its Greek form of Jesus, but in its form of Joshua among Jews today. It means the Lord saves. Salvation is from the Lord. Call his name Jesus, or he's going to save his people from their sins. And he's also called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We look at the idea of the incarnation and we see many important things connected with it. Uh, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, we'll be looking next week at the death of Christ, the story of a God who dies and lives again. By the way, once again, a story that is repeated in folk literature over and again. And there are reasons for that. But we look at Jesus and we find 
that even though he was in the form of God, in other words, he had all of the attributes of God, he took to himself the form of a human. He took to himself all the attributes of human humanity. He is fully God and fully man. But it is the son of God who was sent. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The word only here sometimes is rendered only begotten. However, while that, by the way, is a legitimate rendering of the Greek, it more likely means one of a kind his unique son. There's a sense in which we are all sons and daughters of God through creation, or if we are Christians through the new birth. But there is one who is the unique son. That is who the father sent. Hebrews 10, and by the way, the book of Hebrews, with its emphasis upon the substitutionary death of Christ, focuses a great deal on this idea of the incarnation. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. A body. The body of Christ. Again, next week we'll be looking at that body being put to death. Or he had to have a body. God, before the incarnation, could not have been put to death. But in his humanity, he could be. Furthermore, he never lays that humanity aside. After the resurrection, by the way, the fact that there was a resurrection speaks to the idea of a body. After the resurrection, he's still able to say, look at the nail prints. Here they are. He never stops being Jesus. Saul, on the road to Damascus, was confronted by the Lord. And he asked the question, who are you? Well, the answer wasn't, I'm the eternal word. It could have been could have said that he could have said any number of things but what did he say i am jesus and the new testament closes with the vision that john had on the isle of patmos and how does the lord identify himself there as jesus he never stops being jesus he never lays aside his humanity. And for that reason, he's able to intercede with us even now, being fully God and fully man. Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We look at this and we see that the work of Christ in paying for our sins could only occur because he was not only fully divine, but fully human. Once again from Hebrews, jumping down to verse 17 of Hebrews 2. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation. The question of well, what does propitiation mean? This is one of those things I asked Harvey Floyd about propitiation. And he, he said, it's that which makes one propitious towards another. <laughs> that didn't help me a lot. To be propitious is to be well disposed. 
we use this expression. Whenever there's a possibility of a misunderstanding and we've addressed it, we'll ask, are we okay? What do we mean by that? We mean, is the relationship all right? Is it good? A propitiation is what makes us okay in the sight of God. It makes our relationship good. We broke the relationship. We offended God. But the wrath of God is turned aside because of the work of Jesus Christ. How could he do that for us? By being like us in every respect. Not with sin, but in every essential respect. He was fully human. Once again, from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, verse 10. And by that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The body of Christ offered once for all. Do not miss this. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was done. There are religious groups who teach that every time the Lord's Supper is observed, Christ is sacrificed again. By the way, that is why in these religious groups, what we refer to as the Lord's table is referred to as an altar. What do you do on an altar? You offer sacrifices. <clears throat> and the Catholic Church teaches that when the priest prays over that bread and prays over the cup, it becomes the body and blood of Christ and he is sacrificed again. No. Once for all. It's done. Now, in faith, we receive the blessings of that sacrifice over and over again. As we remember, it's all through faith that we receive the blessings of the body of Christ. Now, we must emphasize that the incarnation is not an intellectual curiosity, very interesting to study, but of no practical importance. If you don't believe in the incarnation, you will end up losing your soul if you follow it to its logical conclusion second john 1 verse 7 for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of jesus christ in the flesh such a one is a deceiver and the antichrist now i do not believe that God is up in heaven looking for, with a fine tooth comb, any mistaken views in order to destroy us. God's revealed himself quite to the contrary as trying to find any way to save us. That being said, there are things that will lead to destruction. And one of these is denying the truth of the incarnation. There is in central China a very interesting artifact. It's called the Nestorian obelisk. An obelisk is just simply a column, a, a faceted column. And on this obelisk, has four sides. One side has a synopsis of the life and teachings of the Buddha. Another side has the life and teaching of one of the Taoist sages. A third side has the life and teachings of Zoroaster. And the fourth side has a synopsis of the life and teachings of Jesus. But it ends with Jesus in the tomb. 
because the Nestorians rejected the idea of the incarnation, of God becoming flesh. And as a result, eventually, they rejected the gospel itself. And by the way, the Nestorians, while they even made it to the imperial court in Beijing, they would recede away and vanish into oblivion. Why is that? Because apart from the gospel, there's no power in what we teach. The incarnation is the hinge of history. God became a human being. God the Son became Jesus and remains Jesus. He changed everything and it changed forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. This is the story of God who became fully human. And the moral of this story is the embodiment of the grace of God. Do you want to know if God loves you? The verse we read earlier, John 3:16. He loved you so much, he sent his only son, his unique son, for you. Does Jesus love you? Well, he loves you enough that he took to himself a human nature with all of the problems that that entailed, and most centrally, his death. The incarnation is the embodiment of the grace of God. That's the way it was. And that's the way it is. We'll continue our survey of the story of God, this epic narrative, next week. Thank you very much.